Well, the last couple of weeks, as we have been in this Advent season, uh, we've been looking with expectation for Jesus, and we've been kind of following some different people and what they were expecting with Jesus, kind of to help us in our preparation. By wondering what they were expecting, it'll help us get ready, and will also help us grow deeper in faith as we think more deeply about who they were expecting and who Jesus actually was. So over the last couple of weeks, uh, we've looked at the prophet Jeremiah and who Jeremiah was expecting. Then last week, we looked at Isaiah and who Isaiah was expecting. And now this morning, we're going to look at someone whose ministry was just before Jesus, really to prepare Jesus, and that's John the Baptist. So this morning, uh, I want to read to you the words of John the Baptist, and what you'll see in them is not only his expectation, but how that started to affect people who lived in that day. And it's some pretty deep, uh, powerful kind of imagery that we're going to break apart and spend some time with this morning. So it starts out in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, starting at verse 7. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Kind of gives you an idea of John's personality right away. Not, hey, welcome, great, glad you're here, but you brood of vipers, you snakes, uh, why is it that you're showing up? Uh, this is the kind of personality that John the Baptist had in the video clip before you kind of get a little sense of his, uh, his roughness and his intensity. Uh, earlier in the gospel, it says that he, he lived out in the woods. He ate honey and locust and wore uh, camel's hair, very rough clothing, a very intense personality. Um, but the crowds are interested. So he tells them, bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor. For the Jewish people, sometimes this was the response. Just because they were in the lineage, they were Jewish by, by their ancestry, they felt like, hey, we're good with God. That's all we need to do. And John the Baptist says, no, that doesn't mean squat. Uh, he says, God would be able to raise up children from the stones if God wanted to. What matters more is your heart and your faith, John says to them. He says, especially picking up that reference to bearing fruit, he says, even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. You could picture this imagery that, that he's giving. Uh, it would be like someone who owned an orchard and you got your fruit trees, but one of the trees is not producing any fruit. So what is the orchard owner going to do? He's going to take the axe. He's going to chop that tree down. He's going to use it for firewood. He's going to plant a, a different tree in hopes that this one will bear the fruit necessary. This is the kind of imagery that John the Baptist used. If you're not bearing any good fruit, you're useless. You know, you're going to get burned up. That's the kind of intensity that John the Baptist had. He went on, and the crowds asked him. The crowds respond to this. The crowds are curious. They want to know, how then can we be ready? How then can we uh, get our hearts and our lives, and, and how can we respond to what you're telling us? So they asked him, what then should we do? They want to know. It's interesting. We hear some of John's expectations of who is coming, who will be Jesus. But we also hear that in the crowds some as well. In their expectation, what should we do to be ready? In reply, he said to them, whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none. If you're doing well, and somebody else is struggling, then help them out. Whoever has food must do likewise. So if you're eating well and somebody else is not, then 
pass on and help them out as well. And then he gets even more specific. Uh, there are particular classes of people that had questions, even the tax collectors. You may remember probably five months back or so, I was talking about tax collectors and how hated uh, they are because they were cooperating uh, with the government. But even tax collectors, uh, that is the government of the, the Roman Empire, even the tax collectors uh, want to be faithful. And so they ask him the same question. Teacher, what should we do? How should we get ready? And he said to them, collect no more than the amount prescribed to you. The tax collectors used to skim and co uh, uh, collect extra taxes. He says, just be fair. This is the profession that you have, but be fair in the way that you do this. And soldiers, these would be Roman soldiers or the soldiers even of King Herod, neither one of them who would have been liked. And we, what should we do? How should we get ready? He said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, which they could have done as soldiers. Just be satisfied with your wages. I find this really interesting, their question, what should we do? We're going to come back to that. But the text continues, as the people were filled with expectation. We've been talking about expectations. Both John the Baptist for Jesus, but now even theirs, even their expectations are, are heightened. They were all questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be it. Maybe he is the one that God has coming, the Messiah. But John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. What an amazing image. Uh, yes, I have a ministry, and yes, you've come out to get prepared and uh, to find out more about the coming Messiah, but the one who's coming after me, the one who would be Jesus, I'm not worthy to be his servant, to reach down and, and strap on his sandals. That's the one who's coming. Where I will baptize you with water, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Again, this is an image that is a little bit confusing to us because, you know, we're not involved in these practices of the ancient world. But in the ancient world, the winnowing fork was a big fork. Uh, you would take the grain, you would put it on the threshing floor, and you would basically beat the snot out of it. You'd beat it, uh, and that would separate the grain that you want to hold on to from the chaff, the shell around it. Um, then you would take the winnowing fork and you would fling it up in the air when there was a breeze. And what that would do is the heavy grain would fall back to the threshing floor, but the, the chaff would bl blow over into a pile, and that's trash. Uh, you might burn that to get rid of it or for fuel, and that's the image that he, he gives us. You know, he's going to take the chaff, that that is unnecessary, that that's, that's, that's useless, and he's going to burn that up, the one who is coming, the Messiah. Now, what the, you know, we've talked about the intensity, the, the personality of John the Baptist. I kind of look at, at John's words, and I think that, that he was expecting someone even more intense than he was, more, more uh, causing for or calling for repentance even than John was. I don't know that we actually saw that in Jesus. Certainly there was some of that that Jesus called the wrong wrong, um, that he, he, he reprimanded those who were wayward. But he seemed to have a more gentle spirit than John the Baptist. And I think sometimes in our expectations of who Jesus is, we think Jesus will be more like us than anybody else. And you kind of see this a little bit in John the Baptist's personality. But it ends the description of John. So with many other export exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. So they heard this, even though this is pretty intense stuff, you know, trees and chaff being thrown into the fire, they heard this as good news to get ready for Jesus. 
And I mentioned before that phrase that all of them asked, what then should we do? How do we get ready? kind of struck me. And I was thinking about this earlier in the week in preparation for this morning, that we would be about a week and a day from Christmas. And I thought this same question, uh, in our own sense of expectation of Jesus, might have some value. What then should we do? You know, we've got a week and a day before Christmas. What then should we do to help to get ready for Jesus? So what I thought I would do this morning is to give you a few moments to actually think about that. I hope when you came in that the ushers gave you an insert uh, that says, what then should we do? Uh, if you didn't, like raise your hand and the ushers will make sure that you have one. I thought I would give you a few minutes to answer that question. What then should we do? I went and Googled and brainstormed a little bit, and I gave you a couple of suggestions that are at the top of that insert. Maybe there's something on there that you would look at and say, yeah, yep, that's, that's what I need. Raise your, I see ushers in the back. If you didn't get one, raise your hand, and they'll make sure you get one. Uh, so there's a couple of suggestions there, or maybe there's something else that in a few moments of silence and preparation that God will kind of nudge you to think, yeah, what do I need to do in this next week to really get ready to be prepared for Jesus? So I'll give you a couple minutes to do that this morning. Now we all know it's easier to make a list than to follow through on that list and kind of guide ourselves a little bit more deeply into the real meaning of this season. So let me end with prayer that what you've brainstormed and written will actually happen in the next week. Let's pray. Lord God, there are so many distractions in this time of year, and many of them do not lead us closer to you and the true heart of this Christmas season. So this little bit of time of preparation, what then should we do? Uh, help us, give us the resolve, help us to carve aside a little bit of time this week to truly prepare for the coming of your Son Jesus in our lives once again. In his holy and precious name we pray. Amen.